What are we going to do? We are going to talk about finding God's will, but we're not covering everything we would normally cover. We're really just turning the spotlight on a particular part of the discussion, that is the work of the Holy Spirit in finding God's will. And so we're going to sort of stay in that area. There's plenty to probably irritate you, so I think that'll be fine. Remember that as we go through this, you please feel free to ask questions at any time. Just stick your hand up. Uh, please remember to you're obligated to glorify God when you ask questions. So you've, you are commanded to love me, whether you, don't, whether you agree with me or not. So, but please ask the questions. Um, it's important that you know, you're, this is a very, very important subject. And you've got to grapple with it. It affects your life so practically, day in and day out, that I honestly think if you get this wrong, you're going to cause a lot of trouble, both for yourself and for other believers. So I want you to challenge what I say. Look at it. Is it, in, is it from Scripture? Is it in context? That's your job. Uh, you're, you're never allowed to simply cut to the chase and say, this guy's a good guy. We trust him. You know, I've been a teacher for a lot of years, and I know good guys have bad days. Good guys just miss it sometime. And that's why the Apostle Paul, who never had a bad day, commends the Bereans for checking him out. So please take that seriously. Okay? Let me give you an overview first, before we, as we get started, as to my understanding of, fi of finding God's will. And that is that... Every decision that you make that does not go against Scripture is, by definition, in the will of God. Any decision that you have to make that does not violate Scripture is, by definition, in the will of God. That it is Scripture is what determines what is the will of God. Now, I understand that that changes the questions of God's will. But, but that is the premise we're working from, and your questions, you can please, you can fire away at that as we go on, but that's where we're starting from. And by that I mean that there is a sovereign will of God, that is, the Lord determines everything in eternity past, so from that point of view, everything is fixed, which means that every decision you have to make is that you have to respond to a scenario that our God has put together for you. He's choreographed for you. So he puts together, you find yourself confronted by something of which you have to make a decision. So the Lord creates the scenario, and then you and I are responsible to make a biblical decision about the scenario. He sovereignly determines what we have to decide. We are responsible to make a God-honoring decision that is a decision that agrees with Scripture about whatever he's put before us. That's the scenario. That's my understanding of how to find the will of God. Now, within that, there is this huge area that is a bone of contention among a lot of believers. That is, what is the role of the Holy Spirit in determining God's will? What is the role? I mean, does, is, is Scripture only good part way to determine the will of God? What about impressions? We all have impressions. What about feelings? What about circumstances? Is not the Holy Spirit involved in all of that stuff? Do we have simply a rationalistic faith that disregards the work of the Holy Spirit? What is your understanding of your intimate walk with the Lord? How does the Holy Spirit affect that? And what is that? We're going to address all of those questions tonight, one way or the other, as we go through Scripture. Please feel free, as we go through, if you think there's a passage of Scripture that is really relevant that I have not mentioned, you are free to, to ask the question, can we look at this? Okay? Because obviously... Uh, you may think that this is going to be interminably, interminably long tonight. But even then, it, we can only cover so many things. So if you have an, a, a passage that you think is really relevant that you want to see discussed, it's your job is to raise your hand and let's put it on the table. And then I'll decide whether I want to look at it or not. And if it's, 
disagrees with my point of view, I won't look at it. That's what we'll do. Turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 19. There is a table of contents in the beginning of your Bible, because I doubt that most of you hang out in 1 Kings. But let me give you the context. This is the famous account, or the tail end of it, where Elijah is battling the prophets of Baal. This is a very famous account. Ahab is the king of the northern kingdom of Israel. His wife is the infamous Jezebel. They have these false prophets. And there's this confrontation between, you know, Elijah and the prophets of Baal up on Mount Carmel. And the account is fascinating. But ultimately, of course, Elijah wins. The, the people kill all the false prophets. As Elijah is leaving the scene, Jezebel confronts him and says, what happened to these false prophets is going to happen to you, meaning I'm going to kill you. Here we have Elijah who stood faithfully against the, in this amazing encounter. He stands faithful to the Lord against these false prophets. But for some reason, we don't know why, he runs scared. And God supernaturally sustains him. He runs all the way to the Sinai Peninsula, which is a long way from Mount Carmel. He runs all the way there to Mount Sinai. And there is where we pick up the account when he wants to meet with God. So 1 Kings chapter 19. And we'll pick it up in verse 9. There he came to a cave and lodged in it. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He said, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword, and I, even I, only am left. And they seek my life to take it away. Now, let's just be honest. When you hear that, you sort of hear a violin playing in the background. This is Elijah embracing self-pity at its best. He is, he is a victim. And things are going bad. And so this is not good, but that's okay. Let's move on and see how the Lord responds to him. Of course, the Lord said, he said to him in verse 11, Go out and stand on the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind came an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, the sound of a low whisper. This is the ESV, the low whisper. King James says the famous sort of phrase, a still Small voice. Okay. It says, And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak, went out, stood at the entrance of the cave, and behold, there came a voice to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? And then again, the Lord just healed him up, sent him on his way. When I was a, I became a believer. Ben came and picked me up in Rocky Mount. I was speaking up at church in Rocky Mount this morning. And this afternoon, Ben came up to pick me up. And we, we were talking on the way back to Greenville about uh, backgrounds and everything and m my sort of background, where I came from. I became a believer halfway through my time at the university. I went to Penn State. Child molest you. That's where I went to. It's <laughs> the way it is, you know. I'm sure there'll be a new T-shirt coming up. But I was there at the time of the uh, Jesus movement. Tremendous numbers. I was involved with Campus Crusade. And we had, I mean, just hundreds was a normal affair. I mean, crowds were easy to grab to get together. We had, we had uh, pep rallies for Jesus. That's hard to imagine, pep rallies for Jesus. But it was a different time. But I remember being taught during this that 
When I have devotions, quiet time with the Lord, I was to have like a three by five card or a notebook with me along with a pencil or pen. And I was to present my you know, prayer request to the Lord, talk to him, share my request. And then when I'm done, I am to quiet my heart. And I'm to wait for the Spirit of God through that still, small voice to communicate. And whatever comes to mind, I'm to jot down. Okay. And this was taught by good guys. They love the Lord. This is really bad advice. And so I was taught that very early on as a believer. And my views on how to find God's will were very different in those days. But this is the verse. This is the only verse in all the Bible. This is the proof text for the, for the, the Spirit of God. And, you, and you, you really hear about it. You hear a lot of folks talk about it. You know, the, the Spirit just, in that gentle voice, He communicates. He indicates. The question is, are you listening? That's the problem. Are you listening? And so... When you're evaluating something, you say, okay, where is it found in Scripture? Let's look at it, look at the context, let's try to understand it. Here, it's not too difficult because the context is rather simple. Elijah, running scared, goes to Mount Sinai. He's going to talk to God. God is now going to indicate to him when it is time to talk. Big wind, hurricane, you guys know about that. It's where you live in Carolina. We don't have those in Arizona. Okay, nope, it's not the time to talk. Earthquake? Nope. My son's in L.A. He has earthquakes. Nope, not the time. Fire? We have a lot of forest fires in Arizona. Not the time. The still, small voice or the gentle whisper. It says, when he heard it, he went outside to talk. This was the indication. That meant it was recordable. It was recordable. Even on my iPhone, I touched the app and I record it. It was not a feeling within, not an impression. We're not talking about Elijah listening through his inner man. We're talking about an audible expression to say, it's time to talk. Time to talk. That's all it was. Now, the question that you should ask, because this is what I ask, is if this is the only verse in the entire Bible that, quote, teaches this, how do we get to where we are today? How do we get to this mess of where we are listening for the Holy Spirit with our inner man? Now, you should understand, I believe that the Holy Spirit is intimately involved in my life. Absolutely. Intimately involved in my life. We're going to talk about what we mean by intimacy. Because my walk with the Lord is not just cerebral. It's not. There, there is a feeling side to it, an emotional side to it. But when we're talking about finding God's will, that's another question. So this is the passage has nothing to do with God's will. It's simply it's time for, for God to talk to Elijah. That's all it is. Nothing more, nothing less. Stop for a moment. Questions about that? Anybody? I would label this, how this verse keeps getting used to justify the Spirit of God speaking to you through your inner man as evangelical folklore. Because there's no, there's no text there's no text, okay? Okay, next place to go. Please feel free to ask the questions. Turn to Colossians chapter 3. So when we talk about what is the role of the Holy Spirit in decision making, Colossians 3 Verse 15, this is a parallel passage, meaning it's saying that basically the same thing as Ephesians 5. In fact, as you find, much of Colossians is repeated in Ephesians. 
little different twist, a little different emphasis, but the content, much of it is the same, a good chunk of it. And for just for the fun of it, let's forget about the context, forget about what comes before and after. Let's just read verse 15. Paul says, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Stop. So that means when I want to determine if, if I'm in the will of God, the question is, do you have peace about it? Because peace is the, it is the Spirit's, Holy Spirit's confirmation that you are going the right direction. Do you have peace about it? Okay? This is the verse, by the way. This is the one. At least in, in one good thing about this study, there's not a lot of verses. There's relatively few. But look at the context. Pick it up in verse 12. Paul says, he's talking to believers, and he says, Put on, then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. And be thankful. What is the context here? The context is relationships. How to have harmonious relationships in a family of believers. How to do that. And the answer is we are to treat each other the way Jesus would have us treat each other. And he, he itemizes what does he mean. He says you need to forgive. You need to be compassionate. Whatever it means to love one another. And if you do this, the peace of Christ will prevail. That's what he means. It means you all get along in a God-honoring way. Once again, this is not a God's will verse. This is a verse that says, if you obey Scripture and how you're supposed to treat one another, you get along. Very simple. Love prevails. The peace of Christ prevails. That is, the peace of how we get along with each other that honors Jesus Christ prevails. It's not really complicated. Because the context is all about relationships. The fact is, when, you, when you're in premarital counseling, and we do this with couples, we would say, okay, let's, what chapter is there in the Bible that talks about relationships? And you say, well, Ephesians 4 and Colossians 3. That's what we tell them. If anything, go memorize these chapters. Then get married. Because we know in marriage, the biggest problem typically is communication. Typically. But this has nothing to do with God's will. This is simply how we treat one another. How I feel is an irrelevant question. If I'm talking about God's will, I'm never going to ask you how you feel. That question is not part of my repertoire. How you feel. If you have conflict in the body, I'm not asking you how you feel. I'm going to say, okay, let's talk about have you forgiven? Have you forgiven? That's a decision of the will, a choice not to use a hurt done to you to bring that up and throw that in the face of somebody else. Have you forgiven? That's a decision of the will. I don't care what you feel. You're commanded, I'm commanded to forgive. Not to use that hurt ever again. If I've forgiven, I've chosen to put that hurt behind, never to reach back, bring it up again, and throw it back in somebody's face. Uh, that is an act of will. Now, I admit, I don't always feel forgiving. Let us be honest. Sometimes it's the severity of the hurt means that I have to ignore bad feelings for quite some time towards someone. Absolutely true. I just can't allow my feelings to affect what I'm supposed to do. I have to walk by faith, not by feelings. That's what I have to do. Stop for a moment. Questions? Okay. 
So in this context, peace is not God's, the Holy Spirit being the determiner, the indicator to us that we are in the will of God because I have peace about it. I really could care less if you have peace about it. There are, there are things I have to do in Scripture that I don't have peace at all. There are times I have to confront people over sin. And let me tell you, I have no peace about that. I don't want to do it. My life can be kind of like going to the dentist. My whole week is wrecked because I know I'm going on Thursday. I don't want to go to the dentist. I grew up in a generation that was hurt by the dentist. You don't need Novocaine. It's almost over. That slow drill and hitting the nerve. I'm just about done. Liar, liar, you're not done. And I, so my kids, my kids can't relate to that. My kids have never been hurt at the dentist. They've never been hurt. It's gentle dem- dentistry. I lived in the age of savage dentistry. <laughs> and both my wife and I, you know, we just wrecks our week to go to the dentist. And you know they don't hurt us anymore. Okay? But this concept of if, if I feel calm, that is the indication that I'm right where God wants me to be. That's crazy. There's no verse that says that. Because sometimes, you know, when I make a big decision, this is just an evaluation of my, my character, my personality. You have, to know, know, you have to learn to know yourself. Every time I make a big decision, this is just me, every time I make a decision, I am fraught with self-doubt afterwards. I don't care what it is. If I go have to buy a car or any big purchase, anything where it, what I consider big, every time I make the, the decision and I sign, I feel miserable. I just do. This is the way I'm wired. I just do. I know that now, so I don't take it seriously. I go back over the facts. Is this, did I make a good, sound decision? If I did, I just have to live with feeling crummy for a while, and then it'll go, over, go away. But I've learned not to take my feelings seriously unless there's facts to back it up. Because we are rather complex creatures. I mean, your emotions are triggered by all sorts of stuff. Your goofy upbringing, we all have a certain amount of goofy upbringing. You know, our cultural conditioning, strange ideas, and things we've repressed, things we're afraid of, insecurities. So emotionally, we are kind of wild at times. You know, things pop into your head, you feel things. For me, it's, you know, if I listen to an oldie station and they play a song, oh, that's when another girl dumped me. This song was playing. I had a history of being dumped. You know, God is sovereign because my wife, who of 38 years, was prohibited by God's eternal plan from dumping me. But I, I, you know, I was a typical, you know, kind of a, insecure kind of a guy that when you, I fell for a gal, I would just go head over heels. I would scare her away because I would just want to badger her and hound her and everything. And she found, would say, you know, shove me away and dump me. That was my, so then there's always, of course, in those days, there's always a, a, a popular song on the top 40 that's playing when that happens. And, and until I'm 90, when that song plays, this is what goes, plays across my mind. Betty Sue dumped me. Cindy dumped me, you know. And so I'm, my emotions are affected because all of a sudden things happen. My emotions get, a floods of emotion come across my life. And the older you get, I mean, Kirk is here and he's even older than I am. The older you get, the more emotional buttons you have that can be pushed about your past. That's absolutely true. So if you, the whole point is, if you're going to look inside to your emotions to determine Direct, authoritative direction by God, you it is a fool's errand. Fool's errand. Well, now let's say, what about, but the question is raised, what about conviction of sin? Doesn't that affect your emotion? The answer is yes, it does. But let's say I wake up one morning, I feel bad. Is that conviction of sin? Well, by itself, you don't know. You have to analyze it. Okay, you say, well, let's say the night before, 
I was really unkind to my wife. And I went to bed, and I didn't resolve it. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. I did go to bed angry. I wake up. I feel miserable, because I really am a believer. I really do love my Lord. And I really do love my wife. Just I'm a sinner, and I just got caught in my sin. But I have to analyze it. Have I, sin is breaking God's law. 1 John 3, 4. Sin is bra breaking God's law. It is lawlessness. If I've broken God's law, then I've sinned. I should feel bad. I should be. There. The Holy Spirit does convict of sin. Absolutely. But, I, but the feeling which I call conviction, I'm not sure unless I analyze it in light of Scripture. Now, I live in Phoenix. We are close to the Mexican border, and we got lots of Mexican food. But if you're 62 years old, you do not eat Mexican food after 7 o'clock at night. Or you can have a very tough time in the morning. Well, maybe I ate chimichangas too late. And so I wake up. I'm feeling miserable. Well, there's a reason I should feel miserable, because I ate chimichangas too late. I should know better. When you're my age, you eat them at noon, and you're in bed by eight. <laughs> but that's the idea. Okay, any question about that? Okay. Yes. No, I don't think there is. No, I took you to Colossians 3.15 because that's one that's popularly used. The Holy Spirit acts as an umpire. That is, the peace of God is the determining factor that you're in God's will. And yet that's not what the verse is talking about. Now, there is another place that is used, and that is in Romans chapter 8, verse 14 as well as Galatians 5.18. So you might want to turn there in your Bibles to Romans 8.14. It's, it's talking about the leading of the Spirit. So now we talk about leading. And so uh, Ben gets up one Sunday and says, I am going to go to less than integrity church in Orlando. And so, and the reason I'm going to less than integrity church is because the Spirit of God is unmistakably leading him, leading me to do this. I cannot ignore that. I cannot deny his leading. I must go. Now, of course, what he said is just put him beyond the realm of checkability and touchability. Because you can't question him. Well, you question the Holy Spirit. Hey, this guy, you know, he, he's got to go where the Holy Spirit leads him to go. I mean, there's no other choice about it. Less than integrity church, here I come. The question is, does Scripture ever use the leading of the Spirit in a God's will fashion? There's only two verses in the teaching passages. Romans 8, 14, Galatians 5, 18. Well, we will look at those right now. There is one more place that's repeated three times in the Gospels when Jesus was led by the Spirit out in the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Everybody agrees that's a unique kind of a thing. We'll just leave that one alone. Okay. But in the teaching passage, we just have the two. So let's deal with the first one. Now, in Romans 8, does, does this affect the recording? My arm keep hitting the antenna up here like this. I could stick it in the very back. Then I'd be uncomfortable, and I'm all about comfort. That's why I don't like it in the back. It looks cool, but... That, this is? Yeah. Better? You sure? <laughs> looks good? That's all. We're just in it for looks. That's it. Okay. Okay. They do call this integrity church. Yeah. Okay. Romans chapter 8 um, is talking about how does change happen in a person's life? to go from 
in order to enable you to live for Jesus Christ? How does that happen? And the answer is it cannot come from the law because law has no power to change you. Law does its job. It tells you what's right and wrong. It's very good at that, but it has absolutely no power to change you. So if you go to, we'll just read a few verses from chapter 8 of Romans. Verse, start with verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Now stop there for a moment, because this is just something in observation. It's really not altogether relevant to our discussion, but since we're coming across it. When I, I say this phrase, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, what do you think of? What does that, that refers to? No condemnation if you're in Christ Jesus. Sins are forgiven. Wrath of God is satisfied. Sin has been paid for. I mean, that's a, that's a knee-jerk reaction. That's not what it means. Read the rest of the verse. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Now, what he's talking about is that as a believer, as an unbeliever, you're a slave to sin. You're trapped. Call that depravity. You're trapped in your sin. When you become a believer in Christ, you are changed at the very core of your being from being a self-centered individual and a rebellious individual to being this incurable God lover. You have a new heart, a new motivation to want to live for Jesus Christ. So you're no longer a slave to sin. Romans 6, very clear about that. You used to be a slave to sin. Now you're a slave to righteousness. He's talking about the changed life. And he says there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And the reason you know there's no condemnation is because you have a changed life. You're a God lover. That's the reason. What he doesn't say, but he assumes you understand, is that everyone for whom Jesus died on the cross for and paid for their sin get a changed life. And it's the changed life which is the visible indicator that your sins are forgiven, that you have no condemnation. So he's, the shift is not the forgiveness of sins. That's not the focus. The shift is over to the changed life because that's the subject matter of Romans 8. This is how we know there's no con you're not condemned because you're a God lover. And no one can be a God lover if they don't have their sins forgiven, because everybody for whom Jesus died and paid for their sins gets this radical work of the Holy Spirit in their life. And so here, the Apostle Paul is saying, he's just jumping ahead and saying, the, the proof that you're not condemned is that you're a God lover. You've been set free from being a slave to sin. You've been set free. That's the idea. Stop for a moment. Qu questions about that. Yes. Um, I have a question about what you said earlier about addiction. Um, let's say if you know listening to hip hop music is causing damage in your relationship with Christ, like it causes you to curse more. But, and, but the Bible didn't say anything about not listening to hip hop music. And by listening to hip hop music, <laughs> causing a false conviction in your life. Okay. Uh, Okay, this is, what is your first name? Ciao. Ciao. Good. Thanks for the question. Hip-hop music. You are asking the guy who of my top 50 types of music, hip-hop is 51. Okay. <laughs> but, but in Phoenix, Arizona, there is a group of guys who sing hip-hop music and are biblically impeccable. Now, the style is not my style. Let's be honest. But they are biblically sound. It's just a little different style. It's just like I don't like jazz either. Okay? So, if the content of the music is causing you not to live for Jesus Christ, if you're a believer, I don't care if it's big band sound or Enya, then you got to make the change. You got to make the change. But that's the issue. The issue is really not so much the kind of music, because we're all different. 
what we, we like. You know, we're just crazy. Some people like tofu. I mean, who would like tofu? But some people like tofu. It's a faux food. Some people like tofu, and some people like broccoli. Some people, you know, we're all weird. We have different taste buds. The Lord sovereignly made us so different. But it's not a right or wrong. It's just different. And kinds of music, music is just different. You know, we all have certain tastes, like we all have certain color preferences or kinds of clothes we like to wear. You know, that is, that's not a right or wrong thing. It's not a moral issue. And the issue is, what am I listening to? I need to pay attention. Is it drawing me to want to live for Jesus Christ or is it discouraging me to live for Jesus Christ? If it's discouraging me, it can be just Christian music, which is bad Christian music, just bad words. You know, there, were, there was a song uh, once I came across. No, I'm the kind of person who doesn't pay attention to the words of a song right away. So when someone says, typically, you know, the song, the words are going to rot your soul, it usually takes me about 35 times listening to the song when I actually hear the words. It's just the way I'm worried. There was a song, it's a Christian song, and, I, and the tune grabbed me. I loved the tune. When I finally listened to the words, they were garbage, unbiblical and I was crushed. Because this was, I love this tune. If I could bend a little bit to do a, com, a, a company, you know, to a, you know, kind of live with the words, if, maybe if I looked at it from a certain point of view, it would be okay, but it was just really bad. So that's my point. It's a good question, but it's, see, the Bible wants us to be more biblically thoughtful, not knee-jerk reactions. And you have to sit down and say, wait a second, this practice, whatever I'm doing, it may, other people may not have problems with it, but am I having a problem with it? it, it you know, is it encouraging me to live for Jesus Christ? Because if you're not a God lover, this discussion is useless, because then your problem is not music, your problem is you're under the wrath of God because you're not a believer. But if you're a believer and you're a God lover, we just need to be honest about our weaknesses, that this doesn't encourage me, doesn't help me, there are, some, there are some movies I can listen to, I can watch. I got no problem putting into a biblical perspective. Doesn't bother me at all. Others, I can't. I just can't do it, so I can't watch them. But that's a personal thing. I draw my own lines. You're going to have to draw your lines. And they won't be identical with my lines. To try to make them identical is legalism. We don't do that. That's not how, it's not how we make decisions. Okay? It's a good question, though. Okay, let's go back to Romans 8. So what we have here, verse 3 says, For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh, that's sin, evil, I mean evil, could not do, by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for, his, and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. Now we're talking about the death of Jesus on the cross. He says, the law can't change us. Well, what does change us? Well, the death of Jesus on the cross changes us. He says, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. So this is what the cross does. So it, it fulfills the righteous requirements of the law. That is, if you get your sins forgiven, you get a clean record. If you get a clean record, you are righteous. And if you're righteous, you're accepted. So the requirements of the law are obey perfection. Obey in a perfect fashion. That's what the law requires, or God curses you. So you can get a clean record either by obeying perfectly, which is impossible, or you can have all your sins forgiven. In either case, you get a clean record. And if you have a clean record, you are righteous. And if you're righteous, you're accepted. So that's what the cross purchases you unconditional acceptance with the Father brings you into the family of God. But the second thing it happens, which is what we want to focus on, is that who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit, meaning you're no longer controlled by sin. That's what it means, not according to the flesh. It has nothing to do with the physical body. Flesh meaning evil. You're not controlled by sin. You're not controlled by evil, because that's what an unbeliever is. But you now have a new heart, so you are being controlled, motivated by the Spirit of God, meaning you cannot miss the changed life that Jesus purchased for you on the cross. It's not possible 
for you to miss that. It's not possible, if you're a believer, for you not to be a God lover. It's just not possible. That's the idea. And so the rest of Romans 8 through verse 27 is all about what does the Spirit do in the life of every believer? What does he do? Let's flesh it out a little bit. And in the midst of that discussion, which is where we are, we're going to look at specifically the issue of the leading of the Spirit. Okay? Questions? Yes? Um, the church that I grew up in, they held the view that you could accept Christ as your Savior at a certain time in your life and then accept Him as your Lord sure. years down the road. So they would handle this passage and say that this is talking about a believer and they're living by the flesh or they're living by the Spirit, whichever one you choose to do. Ah, okay. Right. That is a... Um, that's a common view. And the way we, I would say, the way I know that's not what this is talking about is if we walk through very quickly verses 5 through 9. So verse 5 says, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. To, to set the mind on the flesh is death. But to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, verse 9, talking to believers, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If, in fact, the spirit of God dwells in you, anybody who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. Meaning that he's saying he's putting the, the difference between a believer and an unbeliever. That's the comparison and contrast. Because if you are a believer, using the lingo of Romans 8, you are living according to the Spirit. Meaning that you are experiencing this transforming work of the Holy Spirit that Jesus purchased for you by name on the cross. And if this isn't there, you're not a believer. Because he says, if this doesn't happen, you're not one of us. You're not one of us. Yes. Or become a believer. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. When you come across someone who says, uh, Jesus is my Savior, but I'm indifferent for living for Christ, they need the gospel. Sure, they need the gospel. Because being a believer is a radical thing. You are transformed in, a, in the most remarkable way from the inside out. Your perspective on life just changes. And you are just, you are captivated by your Lord. Now, we talk when we say that, we've got to be careful because the emotional response that you exhibit is proportional to your emotional makeup. You know, if you're from Brazil... I expect a little bit different emotional response than if you're from the Netherlands. This summer, my wife and I were in England. Well, they're a lot like Netherlands, British. I mean, they're emotional, but it's, they're not jumping up and down. But if you look carefully, you can see the emotion. My roommate, going back to Campus Crusade at Penn State in the early 70s, my roommate uh, was a believer older than I was, but emotionally made up very different than I was. Remember that, that uh, pep rally for Jesus I told you about? Well, we're, here we are. Imagine there's uh, two, three hundred people in this auditorium at Penn State. It's by the student union. And there's a pep rally. People up front. I'm standing there. He's standing here. He is literally jumping off the ground. I'm standing there looking at him. I love my Lord. I am emotionally moved for my Lord. I don't jump off the ground. It's not my makeup. You know? Some of you are full-armed wavers. Some are half wavers. Some are one hunt. Others are, I feel deeply, but the arms stay here. It's all relevant to how you're wired emotionally. You just want to be true to who you are. You can't be somebody else. 
And we know this, even in romantic relationships, you can love someone profoundly, but not everybody shows it the same way. Because we're different. We're all, God's in his perfect wisdom has wired each of us a little uniquely emotionally. That's just the way we are. And so we don't want to force you to try to be something you're not. We don't want to put an artificial standard up there saying this is how you express your love for Christ emotionally. We don't want to do that. We just know that if you're in love with him, It will affect your emotions, but to what degree? I can't tell you. I can't tell you. I I can just tell you how it will affect me. I can tell you that. My wife is not the same as I am. We're just very different. Fair enough? Questions about that? Yes. Yes. You do cause problems. <laughs> I think you, you would be a good candidate for less than integrity church. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah, Ben was talking to me on a ride down. That he, was, he feels he's shackled with you here. But I said, with God, all things are possible. Okay. Without, this is a whole nother discussion. I'll give you a very short capsule sort of summary of my understanding of Romans 7. I don't think it talks about Paul as a believer. I don't at all. I think it talks, Paul speaking autobiographically, talking about his life. How he, what it was like before he was a believer. And he's talking in terms of there was a time when I thought I was fine. Then when the law came, I died. There came a point in his life as an unbeliever, as a Pharisee, when he thought he was okay, but then he became aware of the real implications of God's law. And then he knew he was in trouble. And then he's, so then he's talking. If you go to, what I do is I I compare, in contrast, two verses. 723, 8-2. 723-8-2. 7-23 says... But I see in my members another law, by here law meaning principle. Everybody agrees with that. But I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. This person is captive to the law of sin. Okay? 8.2, go to 8.2. He says, for the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. This person has been set free from the law of sin. Same words. Captive, set free. However you handle Romans 7 to Romans 8, you have to account for that change. The person in 7 is captive to the law of sin. The person in 8 has been set free from the law of sin. Everybody agrees that the guy in eight is a believer. Everybody. My point is Romans 6, because 6, 7, 8 are actually one long argument. 6 says that the unbeliever is a slave to sin. A believer is not a slave to sin. You are a God lover who struggles with sin, but a God lover who struggles with sin. That's very different. So that's my understanding that Paul's describing what happened as he was coming to Christ. That he was convicted, because he describes it in verse 13. He says this Did that which is good then, which is the law, did that which is good then bring death to me? He goes, By no means. But then he says, It was sin producing death in me through what was good in order that sin might be shown to be sin and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. What does he mean? Romans 7.5 says that when an unbeliever is confronted by God's law, God's law is good, 
But when I'm confronted by God's law, my rebellious heart is inflamed with rebellion. It stirs up my evil passions. That's the language of Romans 7, 5. Such that, as a result of being confronted by God's law, I sin more, not less. More. That's why the the unbeliever is described as a slave to sin. Okay? Now, one more quick verse that you're in Romans. Go to chapter 5, verse 20. Context is the Apostle Paul is talking about the method that God uses to save us, which is representation. Jesus represents us on the cross. Just as Adam represented us in the garden. We're blamed for Adam's sin, original sin. But in the same way, when Jesus represents all those who are going to believe his death on the cross, he saves them. In neither case were we consulted as to whether we wanted to be represented. That's another discussion. But in the midst of that discussion, you get to verse 20. And verse 20 says, now, the law, in this context, it's Mosaic law. Nobody disagrees with that. Because the the giving of the Mosaic law to Israel on Mount Sinai is the first formal giving of God's law. Now the law came in to increase the trespass. Whoa. But when sin increased, grace abounded all the more. That is, when God gave his law to Israel on Mount Sinai, their sin increased. Now, what does he assume you understand? You understand, number one, Israel is unbelieving as a whole. Temporary, unbelieving picture of the people of God. So when God gives his law, which is good, he gives it to Israel on Mount Sinai. Will they become better? No. They become worse. Why? Is it the law's fault? No. When God's law confronts an unbelieving heart, evil passions are aroused so that we sin more. God gave his law to Israel so that their sin would increase. That's exactly what it says. Why? Because Israel was a 1,500-year historical object lesson showing the futility of trying to be accepted on the basis of what you do. It was not God's intention to save many Israelites. It's the way it was. He describes that many ways. Remember, even when Jesus showed up in his ministry, he first spoke in parables. And it says in Matthew, the reason he spoke in parables was to hide the message of the kingdom, to hide the gospel. Because it was not God's plan, quoting Isaiah 6, to save many Jews. Just wasn't. And in the parables, in the gospels, Israel's getting thrown out of the kingdom. God doesn't throw his real people out of the kingdom. But he does unbelievers who are the picture of the people of God. But that's another discussion. But what we're trying to do is to show you that the Lord describes the unbeliever as a slave to sin. And the believer as living according to the spirit, meaning that You cannot miss this transforming work of the Holy Spirit. We're not denying our responsibility to make decisions to live for Jesus. We're not denying that at all. That is absolutely true. But this is saying that at the end of the day, if you're a real believer in Jesus Christ, he guarantees you're going to grow. Because Jesus purchased this work of the Spirit for you on the cross. And he guarantees it. That's the idea. So that's why... uh, I think when you get to Romans 8, 3, when it says, for God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. Can't transform the unbeliever by the law. Can't do it. What do you need? The transforming work of the Spirit of God which Jesus purchased for you by name on the cross. That is what transforms you. That's the idea. And so now we need to flesh out what does it mean to, how does the Spirit do that? That's really more uh, germane to our discussion tonight. Okay? Stop for a moment. Questions? Nope. Good. Ben, keep a hand on Scott there so he doesn't interrupt too often. I know him. Okay. Go down to verse 12, because verses 9 through 11 in Romans 8 
talk about that if you, or verses 10 through 11, that if you uh, become a believer, you get this work of the Spirit, it means you're also going to get a resurrected body, which is true and wonderful. You get it at the second coming, but that's not part of our discussion tonight, so let's skip over that. Let's go to verse 12, because it's verses 12 to 14 that we want to look at. He says, so then, brothers. Oh, here's, uh, this is an opportunity to pontificate. I also have, you know, there's a, the new version of the NIV, 2011, and they will uh, quote this verse as saying, so, so then, brothers and sisters, that's what they will put into it. And you go, ah, gender neutral, the liberals. What are they doing with our Bible? Let's be honest. When I say so then, brothers, I am aware that there are certain individuals in, in this audience that smell better than others, the gals. And it's a mixed group here. I know when it says brothers, it means brothers and sisters. That's what it means. It doesn't mean just the guys. Because if I took it as just the guys, I would be incorrectly interpreting it. Because that's not its intent. It's just that's the, way, that's the way it was recorded. It's the way they use gender in that culture. But they mean everybody. So if you're going to throw stones at something, when the new NIV of 2011 says brothers and sisters, that's exactly what I end up having to say every time. Oh, I don't mean just the guys. I mean gals too, brothers and sisters. And so the translator said, well, it means brothers and sisters. That's what it means. You're absolutely correct. That's what it means. So that's just, I'm ranting a little bit, but it's, that's part of the privilege of being a speaker. Okay, so he says, So then, brothers, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. That is, if your life is characterized by not living for Jesus Christ, you go to hell. It's exactly what it means. It's not salvation by works. It has nothing to do with that. It's just that a changed life, remember Galatians, I mean, Romans 8, 1, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because those, if you have a transformed life, if you're a God lover... That means you've got your sins forgiven because nobody's a God lover who doesn't have their sins forgiven. Nobody. That's the point. And so here he says, if, so therefore, if your life is characterized by not living for Jesus Christ, this means you don't have your sins forgiven. You are lost in your sins. You're under the wrath of God. You're not a believer. Okay? Then it goes on. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Ah, if by the Spirit you're able to live for Jesus Christ, you go to heaven. That's true. Well, how do I do that? How do I kick in the Spirit? Verse 14, which is our verse. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. That is, if you are a child of the king, son of God, daughter of God, if you are a child of the king in God's family, you are being led by the Spirit into a transformed life. And therefore, you will avoid condemnation. In this context, the leading of the Spirit has nothing to do with God's will. It is the guarantee that you will grow. Without minimizing your responsibility to live for Christ, but it says at the end of the day, if Jesus died for you, if you're a real believer, you cannot miss the changed life. You cannot miss the new heart. Which to the real believer is terribly encouraging because we all encounter sin in our lives that we get discouraged about because we seem to make very poor Progress. We seem to sometimes plateau out. This says it's not possible to get stuck, really. He promises to relentlessly take you through to the end. You will stay a God lover till you die. You will persevere in your faith. When you fall down, you will get back up. You are an incurable God lover. That's the idea. You are being led by the Spirit into a transformed life. And that's why by that Spirit you will put to death the misdeeds of the body. 